Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are very, very happy to be um, uh, putting together this briefing for this afternoon on the topic of, of renewable gas or biogas, hydropower, and geothermal energy and really looking at these particular renewable energy resources in a way that I think that you will find very informative um, because it is our sense, having worked in the energy policy arena for many, many years, that these are renewable resources that are abundant across the country in many different kinds of venues and at the same time that they often are overlooked, underplayed in terms of their whole role in indeed uh, uh, what should be a really comprehensive energy portfolio and that they really offer exciting opportunities that can truly be win-win-wins. So I think that you will find uh, the briefing informative it certainly ties into a lot of the policy issues before the Congress and certainly topics that you hear many policymakers and members of Congress talking about with regard to concern about energy, about reliability, uh, about, well, what do we have in the way of resources in our region or our state? This briefing will help you see and better understand the enormity and the diversity of energy resources that really can provide baseload power, that can provide energy in a variety of ways coming from a variety of sources using a number of energy technology applications. So, it, and as I said, it ties very much into everything from uh, discussions underway with regard to the Farm Bill on both the Senate and the House side, as well as appropriations. Uh, there was an important hearing this morning before House Ways and Means. Senate Farm Bill was being uh, marked up in Senate Ag today. Uh, there are discussions underway and hearings coming up with regard to clean energy standard. So with regard to thinking about all of these issues as we think about energy policy and what does this mean for the United States? Where should we be going? I think this is a really hugely important opportunity for us to really hear from some wonderful experts. So I think this should be a really, really fun discussion. And we will look forward to your questions and comments after our speakers uh, have made their presentations. And our first speaker this afternoon will be Catherine Clay, who is ex the Executive Director of the American Gas Foundation. And, so, and Catherine will be talking about renewable gas. Catherine? Well, thank you, Carol. And uh, uh, let me also thank ESI for uh, uh, organizing this important event today. Uh, I, I think Carol did an excellent job setting the context for our discussion here together. Uh, both parties have been speaking about the need for an all of the above energy strategy. Uh, and it uh, certainly couldn't be more important for us to be talking about that comprehensive kind of portfolio approach. I think often when we talk about that portfolio approach, renewables are mentioned in the list of tools that we need to have in the toolbox to diversify our energy sector uh, to make it more resilient, more environmentally sound, more energy secure. Uh, but when we say renewables, often I think that uh, uh, except for those that are very deeply into the issue, most Americans tend to think that renewable stops at uh, important resources, but a limited list of resources that perhaps stops at solar and wind. And as important as those resources are, our country is really blessed with a diversity just within the renewable space. And the, uh, the topics that I will be speaking to and, and my colleagues on the panel will be speaking to give you some really strong, uh, important examples of that. Uh, the one commonality between uh, renewable gas, hydropower, and geothermal that you'll hear about today that I, I think is really crucial is that these are renewable sources that will allow us to go beyond intermittency in electrical generation. They have a tremendous amount of versatility, uh, and that's one of the main themes I'd like to bring, uh, bring into my messages to you today that I hope that you'll take with you is the versatility of renewable gas uh, in particular. 
so uh, let me first say a, a word or two about the American Gas Foundation. Uh, I uh, am um, pleased to be the executive director of the foundation, which is a 501c3 established in 1989. The mission of the foundation is to be an independent source of information on, and research on programs related to energy and environmental issues with particular relevance to natural gas and the way that natural gas can have a role in a secure and sustainable energy future for the country. The uh, remarks that I'm going to make to you today, also I'll mention, uh, are going to be based on a major study that we completed in 2011, just fall, in the fall of last year. Uh, we have a few copies here with us today. The study is entitled The Potential for Renewable Gas, uh, and uh, it will also be available uh, at the EEI, uh, EESI uh, website for today's briefing, and it's available at the website that you see on the screen before you, uh, which is at the American Gas Foundation. So uh, I first wanted to talk about the benefits of renewable gas and why, why speak about and, and, and also I think many of you are probably, uh, unless you're very, very deep into these issues, may not even be aware of what we mean when we speak about renewable gas. So first of all, renewable gas is uh, an, a kind of a re of renewable energy source that can bring us the economics, the social benefits including new job opportunities and job growth, energy security benefits, and of course environmental benefits. Renewable gas is a carbon neutral fuel that is produced or captured from renewable sustainable biomass resources. So these can either be purpose grown crops or they can be residual uh, crop residue or agricult other agricultural uh, waste products. It also can be captured from landfills and it can be captured from wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, after treatment, well, and it, an, an important point about the second two uh, sources of renewable gas is that it's actually beyond carbon neutral. And what I mean by that is, uh, of course, with biomass, it's, it's the carbon cycle. We have a, a carbon neutral over the, the cycle of, of that. Uh, uh, of course, we have to account for the actual uh, energy usage for the, the transition that the uh, using the feedstock and making the renewable gas from that. In the case of landfill and what in wastewater treatment facilities, we have another ancillary benefits that's actually quite significant, and that is avoiding the emissions of methane from these natural sources or these uh, indigenous sources. And that methane has, as many of you are aware, a very strong global warming potential. Uh, it's on the order of 20 to 30 times on a unit per uh, unit basis as strong a global warming uh, greenhouse gas as CO2. So the opportunity to capture that gas and to use it as a fuel in place of letting it naturally emit into the atmosphere from these, uh, these facilities uh, that are found in every community, uh, landfills, wastewater treatment, uh, that has a tremendous benefit, not just because of the direct use of that fuel, but because of the avoided emissions. And so that's what we mean by saying that this is not just carbon neutral, but carbon neutral plus. The other benefit of renewable gas, uh, and why it's really important to, uh, to make sure that we include it in our discussion of renewables, is the versatility of the fuel. Uh, it can be used for direct use at that site, at that wastewater treatment facility, for example. Uh, it can be used for residential heating and cooling, I'm sorry, and heating and cooking. Uh, it also can be used for commercial applications, manufacturing, including heavy manufacturing, electrical generation, including, as I mentioned uh, at, at the outset, for baseline generation of electricity, and also for transportation fuel, just as CNG, compressed natural gas, can be used for, uh, natural, uh, for transportation as an alternative fuel. You can also do the same thing with renewable gas that's reclaimed from uh, landfills or that's produced on, uh, as a purpose-driven uh, process from uh, agricultural waste products. The potential, if we were to, uh, to fully utilize the, uh, the resource that we have, uh, and this is something that was one of the major outcomes of the study that we uh, undertook last year, is that if we were to push the envelope and take advantage of the full potential as a nation of these uh, opportunities for renewable gas production, we could in fact meet the demand for between 4 to 10 percent of today's natural gas usage. Right? So natural gas uh, we uh, consume on the order of about 23 trillion cubic feet of natural gas every year in this country. And so 4 to 10 percent of that we could actually displace with this better than carbon neutral fuel. 
So uh, with solar and wind, as I mentioned before, uh, one of, um, you know, as important as these are to our, our energy future, uh, they do have some limitations, one being the intermittency, another being that uh, when we talk about things like a debate over a, uh, a national clean energy standard or renewable portfolio standard, uh, often the politics come into play that there are some regions of the country that are more blessed with solar and wind resources uh, than other areas of the country. The good news story for renewable gas is that when we think about where is their potential for renewable gas, which are the states that are the have and the have not states for renewable gas? Well, I'll show you where the haves are, all of them. So this is truly a 50 state renewable energy resource. And what it means is that when it comes to renewable fuels, uh, renewable energy geography is no longer destiny for renewable power. So as a 50-state resource, uh, again, every state has potential uh, in terms of landfills and wastewater generation plants found in every community across the country. But also, most states have potential for either from existing agricultural uh, endeavors reclaiming some of the agricultural, agricultural waste or byproducts that could be used as feedstock for renewable gas production. And other parts of the nation have the potential to actually grow purpose-driven crops that would be grown for the purpose of gasification, for example. Sometimes it could be coal gasification with natural gas or with, uh, with coal to improve the greenhouse gas profile of natural gas or coal energy production. Uh, or potentially we could, uh, uh, it's not today economic, but we could get to the day where entirely biomass derived gasified fuel could be economic for electrical production. Uh, if we were again to uh, push that envelope and take it as far as, as, uh, as we could, if we had the right policies in place and we used the available land and did the, the best job that we could at reclaiming that agricultural waste, our study indicates that we would have, based on those feedstocks, about 9.5 quadrillion BTUs per year uh, at our disposal. Uh, well, that equates to about 80 million households, the total energy usage for 80 million households across the country every year. Uh, of course, uh, one of the reasons that we talk about uh, renewables in general, and, and renewable gas is no exception, are the greenhouse gas benefits. Uh, we estimate in our study that using renewable gas, both for the direct and the avoided uh, emissions benefits, we could uh, have an estimated one, 146 million tons of CO2 equivalent avoided per year. That's equivalent to taking 29 million cars off of our roads annually. And according to an analysis done by the California Air Resources Board as they were developing their low carbon fuel standard, uh, they list renewable gas for transportation as the lowest carbon transportation fuel that's available today. Uh, and uh, as we've mentioned, uh, there are also uh, benefits, uh, if we think of this not just as an energy policy but also as an agricultural policy, this can provide revenue streams to the agricultural sector, it can help uh, deal with agricultural waste issues which also have cost benefits for, uh, for people working in agriculture and, and those, uh, those businesses. Uh, so it's, it is, as Carol said, it's truly win-win-win. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about transportation because I think this surprises a lot of people when we talk about renewable gas. This is actually something that uh, the U.S. Uh, does not lead the world in uh, as we could uh, given our tremendous potential for the resource. In countries such as Sweden and Germany, also other countries in the developing world are looking at this very seriously, but there are active programs where cars on the road, commercial vehicles on the road today in Germany and Sweden are using biogas, or this uh, renewable natural gas, as it's also called, are using that as a transportation fuel. Uh, there are currently 22 models of light-duty vehicles that normal consumers can buy in Europe that are CNG-designed vehicles that are completely compatible with renewable gas. Uh, so uh, this is also a pathway for us for a, a renewable uh, and sustainable transportation system as well as an option for power generation and direct use. Uh, I mentioned job creation, uh, another important aspect that we uh, really wanted to focus on to the study because it's so important in our, in our dialogue today is that investing in this resource, investing in developing this resource, we estimate could help create about 250,000 jobs and those would be in the green technology sector, farming and agricultural production in particular. 
And an important note is that renewable gas is completely compatible with the existing infrastructure that we have in the ground today. So of the 2.4 million miles of natural gas pipeline that we have already invested in as a nation, pipeline that actually we've seen decreased demand. We have excess capacity in those pipelines. Uh, with um, the proper treatment of that renewable gas at the site, it is completely consistent uh, with natural gas parameters. Uh, that uh, govern the usage of pipelines. And, uh, and so the good news story there as well is that using this resource does not mean massive national capital investments in a new infrastructure. We have the infrastructure in place today. So developing the potential, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is that uh, renewable gas uh, has a great deal it can offer the country uh, in terms of that uh, energy security by helping guide us towards a sustainable pathway for transportation, job creation, the environmental benefits, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, it, it's also, uh, it's important that as we think about renewable policy, renewable energy policy, that we think about it through the lens beyond just our, our, uh, uh, our very important but usual suspects, and think about some of these other less often discussed renewables like renewable gas to ensure that the policies that we're putting in place don't inadvertently disadvantage some of these other uh, important but not as often discussed uh, potential players in the renewable energy space. So just as an example of the kind of level playing field that we would seek and that we think is in our national interest, uh, the uh, the investment tax credit uh, that's in place for some renewables, including solar, uh, that's due to expire at the end of 2016. Uh, renewable gas is not currently eligible for that. That's an example where it could make a tremendous difference in seeding the marketplace and, and getting a jump start in investment, uh, which we believe is uh, appropriate given the tremendous potential benefits that natural gas, the renewable natural gas can, uh, can bring to communities across the country. Uh, so with that, just in summary, uh, it's a 50-state resource, uh, clean, carbon neutral, even better than carbon neutral uh, given certain feedstocks, abundant domestic uh, resource to improve our energy security, particularly in the transport sector, versatile, uh, in fact, uh, one of the few renewables that can be used across every single segment of the economy and every single energy uh, end use. It's compatible with today's infrastructure, and then finally, it's a source for job creation. Uh, with that, I, um, I thank you for your attention, and I invite you to also think of the American Gas Foundation as a resource. Uh, please visit our website. You can find this study and other very important studies um, that we hope will influence and, and uh, enrich the debate. So thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, that was a great presentation and, and run through of, again, all of the uh, opportunities and advantages that this, uh, that this particular resource can, can provide. Uh, we're now going to take a look at another huge resource across the country that, again, um, is, is found in every state of our nation. And can, again, as Catherine was saying with regard to renewable gas, as we find with, with hydro, with water power technologies, that there are uh, major, major benefits, opportunities uh, that deal with, with job creation, uh, with a renewable resource that can provide very important uh, benefits in terms of, of reliability, in terms of baseload power generation, and, and indeed, uh, very much an untapped resource to many people's great surprise. So uh, I now would invite Jeff Leahy, who is the Director of Government Affairs for National Hydropower Association, NHA, to make a presentation on this. Thank you, Carol, and I also want to say thank you to EESI for uh, having us on the panel. I think you're going to see many commonalities between the presentations that Catherine uh, gave, I'm going to give, and, and that Carl is going to give as well. A quick um, discussion about the National Hydropower Association. We're the uh, only national trade association that exclusively represents uh, the interests of the hydropower industry. For us, that includes technologies, conventional hydro, pump storage hydro, and also the new water power technologies like uh, ocean 
ocean energy, uh, ocean wave, ocean tidal, uh, hydrokinetic technologies as well. We have IOUs, uh, public power, independent power producers in our membership, uh, as well as equipment and service providers as well. And one of the key goals that I would like to get out of this um, presentation is to bust some of the myths that people see about or have in their heads about hydropower, that we are all tapped out, that there isn't uh, any growth potential, or that um, hydro is only in the, in the Northwest. I think you'll see some surprising statistics uh, in this presentation. So NHA has recently adopted a vision, and that is to double the current contribution that uh, hydropower provides to the electric system today uh, in the US. And some of you may ask, well, what does that mean? And that's what this chart shows right here. It, uh, uh, the hydropower industry provides about 8% uh, of total electricity generation uh, in the U.S., and that represents about two-thirds of renewable energy uh, or renewable electricity generation uh, in the U.S. as well. So we would like to see that double, and we think that's going to play a major role in trying to meet our clean energy goals as we go forward. Some key characteristics of the hydropower fleet. Uh, I think one of the surprising things that people don't know is that uh, currently there are about 80,000 dams in the United States and only 3% of those dams have hydropower generating facilities attached to them and generating power. So there's a tremendous untapped potential there. Um, not necessarily uh, is every dam uh, ready or should be powered, uh, but certainly there's a tremendous amount, uh, universe of projects there for which we could gain a lot of additional power, maximizing the existing infrastructure that we have in place. One of the other myths, I think, when people think about hydro is they think about Hoover or Grand Coulee, and those are fantastic federal projects. They're also very large, but the average hydro project is actually very small, and this chart here on the screen shows how the individual units uh, in some of the hydropower projects across the United States are actually very small projects. Uh, and also, uh, we are a, a large uh, industry that employs currently uh, a tremendous workforce with approximately 300,000 workers across the United States. So this map uh, basically shows you the build out of the hydropower system over time. There they go. Um, so I just thought I would quickly go through this so you can see um, what that means and exactly how all of these projects are spread out across the United States and how they impact power generation from the West Coast to the East Coast, even into the center of the, uh, uh, of the United States as well. And again, I think that butts the myth that the hydropower system is only a system that is uh, a big player in the Northwest. I mean, clearly you can see from across the United States, from New England to the South, uh, to the middle uh, of the country, there are hydropower projects. But what does that mean for future growth uh, in the hydropower industry? NHA, working with Navigant Consulting in 2009 and 2010, put together a growth study that looked at uh, potential new projects as well as the jobs impact of those projects. And as you can see on this slide, we estimated that there could potentially be 60,000 megawatts of new capacity brought online uh, by about 2025. That includes the suite of technologies that we consider in the hydropower industry, conventional hydro, uh, pump storage, uh, uh, and the marine ocean uh, hydrokinetic technologies as well. Um, you may be wondering why so much pump storage, and I think as Catherine had pointed out, particularly with the growth that we're seeing of wind and solar in the West, uh, there are a tremendous amount of opportunities and need for energy storage. And pump storage is the largest, uh, most commercially available right now, uh, system scale uh, energy storage technology that we have uh, in the United States and around the world. And we have about 20,000 megawatts of existing pump storage in the United States, and right now there are preliminary permits and license applications for another 30 to 40,000 megawatts of pump storage alone. And one an anecdote that I, I like to mention too is the, about the need for energy storage is when you look at Europe and particularly when you look at Denmark, um, Denmark is seen as a, uh, a prime example of how you can get to major uh, wind penetration, for example. Uh, the other side of the story that isn't really told all the time is how they got there. And uh, Denmark doesn't do any of its own grid system balancing. Uh, they have an eastern and western connection uh, and basically uh, Norway and Sweden to hydro uh, countries that are primarily rely on hydro for their electricity uh, interconnects with Denmark and helps balance that power out in that direction. On the other side, Germany, with several large uh, pump storage projects, provides system balancing for Denmark as well. So it's really the hydro system and the pump storage system, which is working cooperatively with the wind and solar uh, resources that they're putting on there to create the, the um, 
the balanced grid that they, they, they have and the penetration of those renewables that they have. I wanted to throw this up here to show the fact that there is a tremendous amount of potential. There's about 80,000 megawatts of potential projects before FERC. Again, as you can see, it includes all technologies. It includes at least 47 states, <laughs> so that's almost everyone. Um, not all of these projects will necessarily be built. Um, however, again, I think it shows that the universe of untapped potential that is out there. So we'd like to show that statistic off. And now FERC is tracking online all of the projects that come in for licensing and those projects that are coming online. As part of that study that I talked about uh, from Navigant, we also looked at uh, potential jobs that would come from this development. And as you can see, we came up with uh, 1.4 million cumulative jobs. That's basically a job year uh, that comes from direct and indirect uh, and induced jobs in the hydropower industry. So, and, oh, and the slide's a little funky, but that's okay. Um, but as you can see, that the, the jobs are across all regions of the country. Obviously, a lot in the West, but also a lot in the other uh, portions across the United States. NHA recently, as a matter of fact, last week, had our annual conference in Washington, D.C., and the Department of Energy put out a final report looking at some uh, potential uh, for new projects on existing non-powered dams. And uh, what this slide doesn't show is that, oh, that's okay, is that it's about 12 gigawatts, which we think is a tremendous resource. And the dots that you see on this, um, on this chart show uh, the types of where those projects are located. And again, as Catherine said, in some places that you might not necessarily think of as having renewables, including uh, sort of the Rust Belt, uh, the lower Mississippi, uh, places in the south, uh, and continuing into New England. So we found that very interesting, as well as some additional projects in the west and, and in the mountain west. When we looked at that study, the top 10 sites, as a matter of fact, uh, were estimated to be able to provide 3,000 megawatts of projects. The top 100 sites, 8,000 megawatts, uh, with uh, several thousands of other sites, mainly small projects, that would provide the rest. What we've tried to do here is overlay this map with uh, the wind map, uh, potential map that you see, and then also with the solar map. And again, sort of going back and forth between those, those maps, I think you can see that there's an, uh, a very nice complement between what hydro can provide and what some of the other renewables uh, can provide in terms of potential growth. So to talk about some of the benefits of hydro, hydro does uh, play a tremendous role in supporting electric grid reliability. Um, we like to point out that this quote uh, coming back out of the 2003 blackout, as you will recall, most of the East Coast was blacked out for a while there. Uh, and the U.S. Canadian task force that looked at that um, basically said that one relatively large island remained in operation, uh, and that was in western New York, and that was anchored by both the Niagara and St. Lawrence uh, hydro uh, plants as well. And hydro really served as the, as the foundation to restore the grid uh, back up into working operation. Uh, hydro also provides a, a bevy of ancillary services, grid services, including frequency controlled, load following, spinning reserve, and others. And I am not an engineer or a technical person, so please don't ask me some of the specific technical questions about those. But we do know that those are all important services uh, that need to be provided in order to make sure that when you actually flip the light switch that you get the power that comes out uh, of it. I talked about energy storage, but I did want to put on an, a, another slide um, to talk about uh, pump storage. As you can see there, we have 20 gigawatts already with another 31 uh, potentially to be developed. And, and pump storage really is a great way to integrate uh, renewable resources. We're seeing that particularly with uh, wind projects where in many cases the wind resource profile when you look at it is at night. And uh, that could be an opportunity where these pumped uh, hydro projects could take that excess generation where there is no demand use that to pump water up into a storage reservoir and then maintain that water in place until you need it during the daytime when you meet peak demand when you would release it and then generate power from it. Um, that is a change from how the pump storage uh, uh, system was originally built out. It was originally built out with the nuclear uh, fleet and to uh, increase the efficiencies in the gas, uh, uh, coal and natural gas system. Uh, nuclear power plants, you don't want cycling either, and so they would take that load at night and then use it during the day to follow load. And then 
as a similar slide to Catherine, as you can see, hydro is a clean and sustainable resource. We've estimated as well the kinds of uh, uh, carbon uh, reductions that you see because of the use of hydropower. Um, as well as we do want to highlight uh, that the hydropower industry takes its stewarding resource very seriously and spends millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars every year uh, and on, on environmental improvements. A quick discussion about policy priorities. Uh, we do support increasing the amount of clean and renewable electricity in our, in our system, and we, there are four main uh, policies that we support, a more efficient regulatory process, economic incentives. Uh, we are looking at to see how hydro is recognized under a CES or RES construct, and the need for research and development investment by the federal government. The hydropower regulatory process is particularly long and sometimes redundant, uh, can spend five and five and a half years going through that process, and that doesn't even include uh, the uh, time that you would spend for actual construction. And this comes, and you may hear Carl talk about this, this comes uh, right into conflict with the short-term policies that we have in place, particularly in the tax incentive arena. If you have a one to two year extension of uh, tax incentives, and yet you have a five-year licensing process or seven-year development pro timeline, that those don't work. And you have a very hard uh, time, if you're a developer, going out and getting investment in your project uh, because people just don't see, what, there's no certainty that the, the incentive will be around by the time your project is going to come online. So we're looking at trying to figure out ways how we can bring more agencies together, uh, increase inter intergovernmental cooperation, and try to get the licensing process down to a more manageable time frame that we see for some of the other resources. This is a quick slide that starts to look at some of the different uh, economic incentives that we use in addition to PTCs and ITCs. Our public power brethren use uh, the Clean Renewable Energy Bonds Program, which has now uh, been completely subscribed, and we would like to see more funding for that. We are currently very uh, in, much in favor of the uh, HR 3307, which is a PTC extension bill here in the House. And though I've been talking from a hydropower perspective, this is also very important um, for the new technologies, marine and hydrokinetics. Uh, you know, they are sort of at the forefront of their development phase. They're still doing some testing. They're still uh, moving to commercial application. Uh, but they're going to need time as well in order to be able to uh, come in and use the PTC or some of the other incentives. Again, quickly just talking on uh, RES or CES, uh, making sure that hydropower is uh, recognized in such a program and maximizing that, um, that recognition. And our, uh, a CES is a different policy paradigm from an RES, and as you allow more resources into a CES, we would like to see more hydro uh, included in a CES than we've seen in some of the earlier RES proposals. We think the Binghamton proposal is a strong first start in that direction. And lastly, R&D. Um, on two fronts, once again, for the hydropower industry, we often hear, well, you're a mature, established technology. Why do you need R&D? Well, we're making advancements in the industry and the technology uh, all the time. And I like to say back, you know, the automobile is a mature technology, but yet we're always trying to increase efficiencies, safety, uh, and we're investing in that. And the federal government is investing in that. And so we believe it should uh, for uh, hydropower as well through the DOE water power program. And again, the same is true for the new technologies, MHK. Again, they need that initial upfront investment to help them prove out some of their concepts. I wanted to spend and, and, and wrap up talking about a new report that NHA has released. Uh, we're calling it the Hydropower Supply Chain Snapshot. We released this at our conference again just last week, and we believe it's the first um, comprehensive look at a renewable energy resources supply chain. Um, this is the map. Uh, what it shows is that, and these are companies that provide the equipment and services to license, construct, uh, continue to operate and maintain hydropower projects. These are not the hydropower projects themselves. Um, but as you can see, once again, as we saw with the project map, that this map shows that there are projects, uh, there are companies working in hydro all across the United States. A little uh, information on how we constructed this map. Um, it's a sampling of approximately 200 of, uh, of NHA's 200 member companies, included developers, generators, and major equipment suppliers. Um, however, it is only 30 members of our 200 members. So we really believe that this really is a small slice of the hydropower supply chain. Uh, 
not only that, this does not include the federal system suppliers. So the Bureau of Reclamation's projects, the Corps of Engineers projects. Our next steps are to take this map, go out further to our industry, get more data, go out to the federal system, and really populate this map much further than we have right now. But we think it provides, at least uh, right now, a very good visual uh, snapshot uh, uh, of the breadth of the industry. Um, again, it was about 2,000 companies from across the country. There are about 400 to 550 companies in each region. And as you can see, once again, uh, companies in, in areas where people wouldn't necessarily think that there's an important hydro presence in their area. So again, this is hydro in the south, uh, some of the member companies. And, and this just sort of points out the types of companies that are involved in our industry, from parts manufacturers to gear manufacturers, engineering for, firms, pumps and turbines, hydraulic specialists all across the country. So um, the nice thing about this map is that if you go to www.hydro.org, you can click on the map and you can click on all of the individual dots and see what companies, if they have a website, see what companies are doing and, and what, how their businesses are being supported by the hydropower industry. So I do encourage you to go to Hydro org uh, and take a look at that map and, and all of our other information. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jeff. I always reminded by how tall you are. <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, that in terms of thinking about the supply chain, that it, and that's true with regard to each of the technology families that we're talking about this afternoon, that it's really quite incredible and, and absolutely fascinating when you think about all of the different kinds of companies that are involved in making all of this work. And so you don't have to have a project right in your own community to play a very, very important role in delivering any of these energy, important energy services. And I also have to say, Jeff, I'm so glad that you mentioned Denmark because just yesterday we held a, uh, an event with the Danish Embassy at which their investment and trade minister spoke. And we also had a pump a highly efficient pump manufacturer uh, speak in terms of looking at the whole nexus of energy, water, and climate, and how all of those things come together. And, and I also have to mention, too, that with regard to thinking about um, what Catherine was talking about as far as renewable gas, in Denmark, as part of their effort to phase out fossil fuel use by 2050 as part of their vision, they now have closed all of their landfills because they use it all in terms of agricultural waste, in terms of, of the organics of, of solid waste and everything, in terms of, of capturing all of that so that it doesn't have to go into landfills. And obviously they are tapping those landfills that they have closed for their renewable gas. So at this time, I'd now like to turn to Carl Gaywell, who's the executive director of the Geothermal Energy Association. And geothermal is yet another very fascinating area of renewable energy technology that comes in a variety of forms, can be used in so many ways. A lot of times we think about it in terms of power and in terms primarily of the Western United States, and Carl will talk to that, but also in terms of a little bit with regard to some of the other uh, uh, parts of the geothermal family. But again, something that is, provides very, very important baseload capacity, a highly reliable, uh, and and very renewable, and something that I think that many of us just have not understood the enormous role that it can play here in the United States, and indeed in, is playing around the world. Carl? Put it back up, Carol. Carol, thank you very much, and thank EESI for inviting us, and Catherine and Jeff for your presentations. Um, I want to go a little bit into what's happening in the industry in 2012, which is what Carol asked me to talk about, and sort of why and why, why, what, what makes up some of the factors at least people think is behind some of the trends we see. Let me start with, I think we have some real geologic knowledge deficit in this country. Uh, when we did the 2000 Earth Day event on the Mall, 
We gave out little hand boilers if people did a quiz, five questions, all either yes or no or true or false, real simple questions. At the end of the day, we pulled in all the little papers, and one of the questions we asked, we tallied them up, was the center of the earth is hot or cold? A majority of people said cold. See, so I, mean, I think we start off with a problem here because that's what we're really talking about. I think people find it easy to understand the sun. You walk outside, you look at the sun, and you say, wow, what a tremendous source of energy. All the photosynthesis on the planet, every biological product results from the sun. And you know the challenge is how do you do it economically? How do you use it in a way that you can actually make it viable for an energy source? And in a sense, geothermal faces the same issue. The heat in the earth is enormous. Here in Washington, D.C., you might dig a trench six, or six feet under the ground, eight feet under the ground, and put in a geothermal heat pump because you're using the constant temperature of the earth. But you could also drill right here, 20,000 feet down, and the rock is boiling hot. And you could produce power. You could use that for energy as well if you wanted to drill that deep. And that's not so crazy. The deepest oil wells today off China run about 38,000 feet. So it's possible. The question is, what are the economics? and what is the technology capable to do within those economic frameworks. So it's very similar to the way people have thought about solar over the last 30 years, because solar was always very high end, very expensive. But with consistent work, policies, and efforts, we brought the cost down dramatically. And we've seen some of that trend in geothermal, but we've not seen the same degree and extent of the support. But let me, let me go through some of the basics real quick. So in 2012, we just published our industry report which is available on our website. It, we update it every year in terms of how many projects are out there. And today there's about 3,000 megawatts of capacity online in nine states, mostly in the West, but we have 147 power projects under development, which is about, according to the developers of the projects, 5,000 megawatts of additional power. Now, we also have some interesting new things that are coming up. We have 17 demonstration projects, which is supported by DOE, looking at some new applications not just drilling deep for really hot resources, but looking at different resources. For example, low temperature co-production from oil and gas wells. Thousands of oil and gas wells produce hot water. The hot water is, they pay for electricity to pump it up and then they have to pump it back down. Can you capture that hot water and use it to produce electricity to run the oil field or possibly sell commercially? Well, we're just starting to demonstrate those projects. One was just finished last year in Louisiana and more are ongoing. But this is the type of new application you're seeing. And then we have seven advanced demonstration projects looking at what enhanced geothermal systems, or I like to call them engineered geothermal systems. So instead of finding a natural place where the earth and water interact and you've got, you tap into it, you drill down and find out what's called a conventional hydrothermal geothermal system. You've got hot water ready to take up from the ground. You're creating that system by fracturing the rock. So those EGS systems are the type of things that the MIT report a few years ago talked about would have an almost unlimited potential in terms of geothermal as an energy source. And we're seeing small distributed systems as a new trend in a number of states now with power online. Just in the last few years, Alaska, New Mexico, Oregon, Nevada, Wyoming, some of the new states have not been major power projects. They've been essentially distributed generation using small power equipment. And you can see the expansion here. We have nine states. Five years ago, we had four states under production. So we've gone from four to nine, and today we have uh, 15 states with projects under development, almost a third of the country, and in terms of land mass, more than a third of the country, which is pretty good, moving from California, Utah, Nevada, and Hawaii to a third of the country in, in a matter of really a few years. Uh, and this is what a geothermal plant looks like, because people don't know. In fact, I think it's rather surprising when they view them, because a typical plant today is like the upper left-hand plant is an air-cooled binary plant that's the Enel Salt Wells plant. And to the right is part of the steamboat complex, which ORMAT operates. The ORMAT complex on the top right, these again are all air-cooled plants. There's no water tower. They're fairly low profile, 20 feet high at the highest point. That complex provides all the electricity needed for the entire, all the homes in the Reno metropolitan area. Um, and it is located in the city limits. In fact, it's located right where the interstate comes, with, comes into Virginia Avenue. Everybody in Reno drives by it. And if you ask people in Reno, do you, have you ever seen a geothermal plant? Most of them will say, I, I, don't, I don't know. Did I? Have I? You'd say, then you point out to them, have you ever gone to the intersection of 295 and Virginia Avenue? And they say, of course. They say, do you know what that is right next to the shopping mall? Those are the power plants that provide your power. So they've changed as we've moved into a lot of binary power production from what used to be more 
power plants with cooling towers. All but one of the projects brought on in the last five years are these type of binary air-cooled systems. And then in the lower right-hand corner is the power system at Oregon Institute of Technology. Again, a binary power system in the university, which is now providing all the power for the university complex. It used to provide just the heat. Now they're providing the power as well from their own resources. And part of this is technology development. The binary power systems have only been available since the early 90s. And the move into small binary systems is really only in the last few years. And partly because the technology is available, people are finding ways to use it. I mean, I think it's, a, I, I call it the build it and they will come sort of scenario, which is the technology is available. You can buy these small modular systems. As you see on the right, they're used for waste heat. They're used for biomass heat. They're used for geothermal projects. Companies like Turbine Air Systems, Ormat, Moffy Trench build them. They're used for multiple resources. And you can buy them off assembly lines, which five years ago, you'd have to have them custom made. And that's changing the face of this industry and I think several others. And I think you'll see more change in that area over the next few years. So what's possible? You saw 15 states. Well, Congress, this place, asked the U.S. Geologic Survey to do a resource estimate and tell them what they thought was possible. And here's their numbers. DOE likes to talk about the middle of the middle, undiscovered geothermal systems. They like to talk about a 30 gigawatt capacity. Well, 30 gigawatts is a lot of power. If you put 30 gigawatts online, you would power all of California, which is about 10% of the nation. Um, the fact is that's, you know, $400 billion worth of investment or more, however. So we've got a long ways to go. And then at the bottom, you can see the EGS is just, you know, off the charts. If you develop advanced technology, your potential is just almost unlimited. If, and um, so what does the industry think about this? the government's estimates. Well, I'd say the industry thinks that the potential is vast, but there's lots of problems. First of all, the significant, there are significant risks related to the subsurface, finding, developing, confirming the resource. We do not have the same type of technology that oil and gas has. It's very high risk. You're spending your own money because nobody's going to finance you to do geothermal exploration, or you're spending very expensive money, and that's a major area for technology could help. Uh, as well as you'll see in a minute on my comment on how incentives don't fit in. Secondly, we have long lead times for projects, and you couple that with high risk, and you've got a problem. I mean, you can go to somebody and say, invest in my project, you might double your money in two years. But what if you come up to some, invest in my project, and you might make 50% back in 10 years? I mean, high risk, long term, is a, is a double whammy when you come to investment in projects. And for geothermal, projects today are taking four to eight years to come online almost half of which is the time it takes to process permits, applications, leases, et cetera. Um, government policies are a mismatch. I'll get into that in a minute. But again, long lead time projects, short term credits. Quick example, 2005 Energy Policy Act, Pete Domenici sponsored, various people voted for, Congress passed. Revolutionary for us because the 2005 bill included hydropower and geothermal in the production tax credit, which was written in 92 for wind, it was pretty exclusively wind up to 2005. Great, they put geothermal in the production tax credit in 2005. They also rewrote the federal geothermal leasing program at the same time. Well, the PTC extension for geothermal was three years long. It took them two and a half years to write the new leasing regulations. So there was a bit of a mismatch right from the get-go. But again, I think we all know part of this is you've got to put all the pieces together, and sometimes in Congress, some things are a lot harder than others. Um, and federal resource support, again, has been inconsistent. Let's be nice, and I'll just call it inconsistent. Um, these match up pretty much with what the industry would say the drivers are, what's driving growth. And we've seen slow but consistent growth over the last, since 2005, really. Um, and we've seen even more dramatic growth in the world market. But the U.S. market continues to move forward even now, even despite its problems. But it's being driven by federal tax incentives, state renewable standards, which are providing supply, federal leasing and permitting, which finally got underway after the bill got passed, better technology development both by industry and with support from DOE. And I think the prospects of climate change legislation, particularly in California, which it's not a prospect but a reality, is driving a lot of investment interest because people look at what California has committed to do over the next 20 years, even 10 years, and they say, holy cow. I mean, it's an enormous lift for California. They're going to have to do tremendous changes in their electricity system. And technologies like, frankly, hydropower, gas, everything is going to have to play a big role. 
And for the first is, let's take the first one, state renewable standards. Right now, I'd say state renewable standards, particularly in the West, are floundering. First of all, they're overcommitted. More renewables are being bid into these renewable portfolio standards than they could possibly buy, which is an incredible place to be. We've actually got too much going forward. But then they're trying to figure out now, how do we make it fit? How do we get the, the regulatory system so that it values things correctly? Back in the last California blackouts after the year 2000, Cambridge Energy Research testified before the Senate Energy Committee. They said the reason California messed up was its system valued energy but not capacity. In other words, they gave you the same price for a kilowatt hour, whether it was produced at 1 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's a bit of a problem. And that gets to be a big problem when you try to piece things together. This is actually the August 2nd, 2011 chart from the California Independent System Operator. And you can see on the right the different technologies. You see the yellow is solar, how much was produced that day and when. And that's a, that's a 1 through 24 hour clock. Wind is second, small hydro, biogas, and the bottom is geothermal, which as I mentioned earlier is a baseload technology, or at least is used currently as a baseload technology. And on the right, and this is a constant source of frustration, is how people don't understand the difference between megawatts and megawatt hours. Megawatts on the left, the peak production, megawatts, is the capacity, in other words, the, the potential output of the power plants in California on the ISO. The right is the daily production in megawatt hours, meaning how, many, how much electricity they actually produced. So for example, you've got 400 megawatts of solar producing 4,000 megawatt hours. You've got 1,000 megawatts of geothermal producing 22,000 megawatt hours. It gets complicated. And when you're the ISO in California and you're trying to keep the lights on, you have to keep all of this balanced so that it matches your demand. You have to do it every minute of the day, on the minute, and you have to do it in the, all the different service areas. So right now, they're going through a process trying to, how do we value these things, and how do we give full value to resources like geothermal, which frankly, in today's world, are not just baseload, but confirm as well. Most geothermal plants can, can load follow however you want to use them. And the debate now is, however, causing, I think, a bit of a stall as they try to figure out how we go forward and meet these big obligations of the future. And this, just to give you a quick, quick glimpse, is how it all fits together. This is the actual daily production for that same day in California. And as you can see, hi oh, by the way, I should mention them, shouldn't I? Hydropower is split. In California, small hydropower is renewable, big hydropower is not. Okay, so hydropower here is the other hydropower. Uh, but this is how they, they match up with their whole system. And as you can see, this is 10% of the state load is, is currently renewables. But they're talking about going to 40 to 80 percent over the next 20 years. And how they do that, and they fit that earlier chart together so they get the right technologies to give them reliability to meet that demand every hour of the day is going to be a huge task. And they're literally de talking through, debating the rules right now about how do we do that. Federal tax incentives, as I mentioned, it started off sort of on a wrong foot with the leasing program and the tax credits starting at the same time. But you've got a four to eight year lead time on power projects. Tax credit expires at the end of 2013 and is biomass, uh, hydropower, and geothermal wrote to the both tax committees. Right now, we're effectively at our deadline for new projects. So if, so if California is procuring new power, it's procuring power for after the PTC deadline. So for a geothermal plant, we can't include the tax credit. For a solar plant, because they went out through 2016, they can. Now, Congress gave solar that longer time frame because of their longer lead times. And in fact, there's some legislation pending to uh, consider adding geothermal into that same pot through 2016. But the longer question is the mismatch of lead times and incentives. And there are the different technologies, frankly, have different issues with respect to this. Uh, federal leasing and permitting. The biggest issue here was is running out of resources. I met yesterday with Ray Brady from BLM. And they created a trust fund, a real honest to goodness trust fund, one of the few in the actual treasury system which, by the way, OMB seems to hate with a passion, um, that um, was through five years past the 2005 energy bill, and they are now spending the last dollars of that trust fund. So the support for leasing, permitting, and all the processing for geothermal is about to go away. And, but leasing and permitting has gotten a lot better, although it's, I mean, I shouldn't say it's gotten a lot better. We went from zero. In 2005, there hadn't been a, ge a federal geothermal lease issued in 20 years. There were applications pending, thousands of them. 
that had never been processed. So, I mean, we're doing better compared to nightmares. Um, DOE support, and this is pretty erratic, as you can see. That's the actual dollars adjusted for inflation for the DOE geothermal program. I mean, there's always, a, I'm, I'm not a big one on dollars for dollars. I'm a big one on what are they spending their money on? And is it being spent effectively? But when it gets this erratic, it's a problem. And when people look at the geothermal industry where we need subsurface technology development, I mean, this is an industry where you spend 10 to $20 million on one well. You've got a technology program with a $15 million annual total budget. You don't do much. So only in recent years, we've seen an increase in the program. I think the industry thought that their budget last year, the approach that program's now taking is, is pretty good. I think we have our own comments on it. But the long-term trend, again, you don't develop new technology and deploy it without a sort of a little more consistent support than, than what we've seen in the past. But in the meantime, there's very strong growth in the global market. Geothermal has been growing slow but steadily in the U.S. since 2005 and around the world it's been booming. We've seen new projects in East Africa and Indonesia. Indonesia has, tr has a laundry list of projects under development. Philippines, Japan has made a major new commitment to it. Uh, Chile is doing, doing a lot with geothermal energy. And the National Export Initiative noted that there were two technologies which they estimated the U.S. exports more than it imports, hydropower and geothermal. So it's one area where we still seem to have a fairly strong technological lead and people around the world look to the U.S. and U.S. companies for the best technology, which I think is great. It's nice to feel that way. Um, and this shows you the difference. The lower is the U.S. market growth, which has been fairly anemic in recent years, uh, compared to the world growth, which has been fairly strong. So last note on a plug here, um, all the congressional offices should have received an invitation. We are doing an event May 23rd. It is not a pitch you policy event. It is an international meeting. We have representatives from government of Kenya, the Energy Minister of Nicaragua, Energy Ministry of Indonesia. We have 20 different countries coming to talk about what they're doing in geothermal energy, both companies from around the world and governments from around the world. We'll be at the Ronald Reagan Center. If you didn't receive an invitation and want to receive one, we we can make sure you get it, just let me know. And here's where you contact me and you can get our April update and other information on our website. We don't charge for our documents, they're all free. Um, and that's it, am I done with my time? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carl. And all of the presentations will be posted on EESI's websites along with the links to the different reports and events and everything as well. So you can go to our website as well as, um, as going directly to, um, to the websites that, that everyone talked about. So I think listening to everybody, I mean, this is why I feel very, very optimistic and excited about what it is that we could really do. A theme, again, coming out of yesterday's forum uh, with, with Denmark was that the consistency of policy was extremely important in terms of the partnership between business and government in Denmark as they really put together their vision and their plan. And it has really, really paid off for them in terms of their global energy technology leadership and how they are, are you know, accessing um, not just the, uh, creating great innovation in their own country and their market, but driving innovation around the world. And I think that what we've heard from each of our presenters today shows that enormous opportunity and why we should feel encouraged about what it is that we, that really could come forward here. So let's open it up for your questions or comments and just identify yourself, please. Did you learn something? Are you excited? Okay, go ahead, over here. Climate change is an important issue for the hydropower industry, and it's one that we're actively studying and, and, and our members are studying. Uh, over the course of the 100-year life history of, of hydro plants in the United States, we've gone through some droughts, we've gone through floods. Um, certainly, there needs to be a lot more work done on modeling and uh, predictive uh, predictive modeling on uh, uh, what the impacts of those will be. I don't think you can really, I don't think the models yet are there where they can 
go down to specific regions, localities. They're, they're much more higher resolution or lower resolution at, at this point. Certainly it's something that, that we are working at, uh, looking at. Our, our members do know how to moderate their, their operations to adjust for some of that. One of the interesting things that is, is raising in the hydropower community and I think the, um, uh, the western coast initially as well, just generally, is do, are we going to need more storage for water? If you're not going to have the snowpack that you usually have because of climate change, what does that mean? And does that mean potentially you're going to need more dams in order not just for hydro generation, but for water supply, irrigation, and, and everything else? So I think that is a question that's out there and one that we're taking very seriously and looking at. I think I, I, I am optimistic. I mean, like I said, I've certainly, you know, the, ver the various regions throughout the country, we've seen droughts in the south, we've seen droughts in the northwest, and then we've seen, you know, the northwest had one of their best water years last year. Um, the south rebounded from, the, from, the, from what they saw earlier in 2005, 2006. So um, I think probably the trickiest issue is going to be the extremes. I mean, we've done droughts, we've done wet water years, but maybe we're going to have higher highs and lower lows, and that's going to be something that our operators will have to, to work with. And I was just going to add, too, with regard to thinking about snow melt, or in terms of, of smaller snowpacks, but sometimes if there's a large snowpack and you're really concerned about it melting too fast, which makes storage really important too, so that you can help um, uh, calibrate the, the flow uh, a little better. Okay, back here. Uh huh. I don't have an average or a median size for you. I know, generally speaking, they're um, anywhere from about 500 to 1,500 megawatt projects. So these are large capital-intensive projects. In some cases, they pencil out between one and two billion dollars in order to build. Okay. Uh huh. Well, I, th I think the, the emphasis on, e on the EGS systems misses the fact that there's a lot to do between now and there. Um, I mean, we're looking at 3,000 megawatts online today. There's as much as 80,000 megawatts under development. I mean, we're, t this last year we, we added 100 megawatts online, just short of a billion dollars of investment. You know, if you, you're looking at 80,000 megawatts of conventional potential that we just simply haven't discovered you're talking about almost a trillion dollars of investment. So, I mean, we've, I think things get a little bit out of place. I think there's a, there is time to work with EGS. I think that everything we do in terms of the research program, we will learn things that will help conventional systems and that we can do it in a way that we're able to confidently address the issues related to which, you know, fracking brings up about induced seismicity. Um, we are participants in a protocol with the Department of Energy, the Swiss government, the Australian government, and all EGS projects follow the protocol in terms of pre-screening and careful monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a doable issue. I don't think it's something that should be a showstopper, but it could be if you push too fast. If you decide, gee, we need to do EGS tomorrow, I think that we, we need to develop that over the next two decades. Well, I mean, I, th I, think, I think it's sort of ironic when people talk about this. I mean, there's so many myth myths about taxes. It's in just incredible. First of all, most of what's permanent in the code right now is temporary at one point. A lot of the original energy incentives for oil, gas, et cetera, start off as a temporary incentive and get extended and get extended before they either get dropped or written permanently into the code. 
So I think there's a bit of an evolution that occurs with Congress and policymaking because it wants, first of all, I think Congress wants some idea of what is its incentives doing over time. On the other hand, I think that, that it's also ironic to see that when we have this debate comes up, a lot of the, we call them big dogs, have permanent credits. So people, I, I've had a number of people say to me, well, how come you guys have those temporary credits as if that's what we wanted? Uh, that's what we got. And, you know, for example, for geothermal and I'm sure hydropower to be included in the production tax credit at all in 2005 was a huge, huge leap and gave us a big, big push forward. So, I mean, you, you, you know, they're going to give you three years of the production tax credit and you go to your companies and they'll say, gee, that's going to be tough. Only so many projects will apply. Well, you're not going to say no because it's going to mean new investment in your projects. And you're going to say, well, we're going to come back and try to push that further. I think the ultimate goal here has to be a rationalization of tax policy in terms of energy. And I think, think that is a discussion we need to have. I know my industry is assuming that will occur. I mean, we've had the president talk about making permanent credits, which is great. And we've had the Congress talking about discussing a more rational tax policy. And I think the two of those actually, maybe in the next Congress, uh, could work together. Because, you know, as we're saying, the PTC doesn't work for everybody. Everybody seems to get in. And also, people don't realize you know, clean coal in the, in the form of carbon sequestration and nuclear power are also in the production tax credit. They just have later deadlines. Um, everybody that sort of Christmas treat into the PTC when they were writing it in 2005 and then 2000 revising it. Uh, but I think things will head in that direction. Uh, but I think that there are tough choices to make here in terms of how we get this done. And it's also incremental. I mean, as Carl said, um, both of our technologies got in in 2005, but um, that was conventional hydro. Marine and hydrokinetics didn't get in until 2008. And even once hydro and marine got in, we got in at half credit. So we're not even getting the full credit that geothermal, wind, and, and others are getting. So I, I agree with Carl. You sort of take it step by step, and, and you try to make improvements as you go forward. And I think the challenge that we're going to have, as Carl was alluding to, is how do we do all of that in the constrained fiscal environment that we have right now? I think that's made our job tougher. And it, it even gets worse because for geothermal power, we were included in the production credit, but heat pumps weren't included until just a couple of years ago. So it, it, I think it's important, and I think most of the staff here know that we, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the process here actually is a lot of, there, there are a lot of people who are trying to look at this and say, how are different things treated? How do we move forward? And, uh, you know, I, th I think we'll have another round of that in the next couple of years, next year or two. Right. And it's not all that many years, obviously, that any of this has really been in existence on the, on the renewable side. Catherine. Uh, I just wanted to, to add that, uh, and, and this was alluded to, that in, in this very difficult financial, uh, very financially constrained environment that we're having these debates in now, that, that uh, it's, it's not just the, the tax credits that we need to be talking about. There are very powerful policy levers that are revenue neutral, like the clean energy standard and renewable portfolio standards and at the state level, and, and getting a level playing field in those as well, uh, particularly in this very challenging environment for any tax package to go forward, we need to be thinking about those very powerful revenue neutral uh, levers. And Carol, if I could, I just would like to say, you know, we, I, at NHA we often say that, you know, there's not going to be one silver bullet that's going to fix our energy needs or our energy issues. I also think there isn't one silver, silver bullet, whether it be in the tax code or other incentive policies that um, apply universally across all of our technologies. There are going to need to be tweaks uh, to recognize what geothermal needs versus what hydro may need versus what uh, renewable gas may need. And um, so I, and I think, as Carl said, I think people are starting to understand that, that yes, there are some policies that will certainly benefit all of the technologies, uh, but there are also going to be needed some tweaks and some specific policies uh, to make sure that it works correctly for all of our individual technologies. There's no one size fits all. Important point. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the first part. Was this a, the, the boom in natural gas? Uh, okay, great, great. Uh, so uh, with, with regard to renewable gas, uh, the, 
in the short term, uh, we're seeing very, very low prices for natural gas. It's in the order of $2 per MMBTU. That, that will not, gas prices will not remain that low. However, they will remain low and stable going forward. Uh, most energy analysts predict that over the next couple decades, they'll move in that envelope between about $4 and $6 per MMBTU. Um, but, but given that, it, it's, it is true that low gas prices have made it more challenging for renewables to compete. It's, uh, you know, natural gas is, is often the benchmark for competition, and lower gas prices than we would have predicted five years ago before the shale gas boom, um, it, it changes the prognosis going out and, and what the economic competitiveness has to be. But, but having said that, uh, the, the importance of diversifying the energy sector uh, that still remains, and that's why policy is going to be important. And that's why things like a renewable portfolio standard and clean energy, energy standard uh, have to maintain a pathway forward for renewables to be part of that. Natural gas is going to be an important foundation fuel going forward, uh, but we, we want to have a, a resilient, diverse energy sector, and all the more reason why we need the right policies for, to uh, provide a foundation for all of our for, for all of our, um, our energy sources. Obviously, cheap gas in the 90s was devastating to renewables. You look back at the early 90s and there were no renewable projects going forward in California for a number of years. We're, we're, we're struggling with that right now. Just the other day, I know there was a gas deal at over $4. So we're getting back up in the 4 to $6 range, which is less of a problem. But I also think this is a really critical thing for people to think about. From a policy perspective, what exactly are we doing here? Do we have a renewable portfolio standard, or is, or is it a renewable price standard? So you just want the cheapest thing you can get, and that's, was that the whole purpose of this? Um, I think most of these RPSs in, the, in California were driven by things like environmental costs, water availability, climate change, issues which, in fact, you ought to be thinking about cheap gas as good if what you're trying to do is move forward without the price impact. I mean, we get whipsawed by this. Prices go up, great, now we're competitive, but nobody wants to pay anything because the economy's bad. Prices go down, nobody wants to buy anything because they're so cheap, why can't you beat them? I mean, it could use against us either way. I think we have, from a policy perspective, have got to look across the, the troughs and the peaks and say, where are we going with energy policy and still move forward with the technologies, whether it's the state of California or the federal government want to see developed and move forward and not whipsaw the technologies, because otherwise you'll, you'll, you'll do what they did to the geothermal industry and to others. You've devastated these industries over years. You, know, you build up not just developers, but infrastructures. Who are the people who provide your, those power set, you know, they, what they call rank and, pico, uh, rank and power cycle en you know, engines? Well, we now have half a dozen new manufacturers in the U.S. producing them. If you want them to stay in business and, by the way, compete with each other, which is great because it gives you better product at lower price, they need to have a continuous market. So energy policy actually has got to be based more upon what's the cheapest price. And right now that, in fact, is, is a debate, and a very active debate, and one which could have critical impact on our industries. And I think quickly all I would add is that price is not the only issue. It's a, it's a combination of issues. Uh, in the hydropower industry, there are some projects that are competitive with natural gas right now. Um, but the issue is our regulatory process. And so even though you're competitive, if uh, someone can do a natural gas project in two to three years versus a hydro project, which is a six to seven year um, uh, time frame, you're still going to lose out. And, and so it, it's all of those things that have to be put uh, into consideration. As an example, we've heard one member company of ours who is a, basically a 100% hydro company and said, you know, at this point, we're not going to build any more hydro. We'll go to natural gas. And it's because of a variety of all of those uh, issues that are coming together to force them into that decision. I, I just want to re-echo the point on time frame. As we've discussed in a number of different ways, that's a really critical issue because whether you're talking about biomass or geothermal or hydropower, the baseload technologies all take a lot longer to build over time. And when you've got policies, whether it's procurement or short-term prices that are saying, like in California, the procurement cycle is two years. They say, gee, why didn't we get any more geothermal companies bidding? We don't think there's any resource. Well, you don't build a plant in two years. I could, you know, BLM would permit my plant in two years, maybe I could build it. But they, that's not going to happen, especially in California. So this leveling out and understanding that's part of the picture is, is don't just choose what's quick, 
but have some policy that works over time, I think is important. And I'm gonna riff off of Carl. <laughs> um, you know, all, these projects are also long-lived projects. I mean, in, hydro, in the hydropower industry, we have projects that are 100 years, you know, and still running efficiently. Um, uh, so you do, over the life of that project, it's a very economic project. It becomes the least cost power. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the Northwest has some of the lowest power rates, the lowest power rates in the country. Um, but yet, you know, financing is not done on a 30-year, 50-year, 80-year scale. And so um, those are the that's the issue we face as well. Right here, Catherine. And, uh, just add a couple, a couple more thoughts. Uh, uh, some of um, the, you know, the thought leaders in the natural gas industry also are aware that uh, that, that renewables offer an opportunity for natural gas and that there's an opportunity for partnership. So um, this panel isn't about the um, wind and solar intermittent renewables, but in those cases, there's an opportunity for natural gas peaking facilities to work in partnership with installation of, of wind and solar. And so I think going forward, uh, a lot of the thought leaders in the natural gas industry are starting to think about what is natural gas's role going to be in a more carbon constrained world. And part of that is how do you partner with renewables? And then what I spoke about today, the potential for renewable gas, is the long term part of that vision as well. As we make investments in natural gas power generation or direct use of natural gas, in the decades to come when we live in a more carbon constrained world, if we continue to develop the resource of renewable natural gas, those investments will not be stranded. They will be compatible with the transition to this renewable fuel. Great. Okay, go ahead. Uh, with the renewable fuel standard, uh, or it, you're speaking about the fuel standard? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. It actually, it actually is, uh, and it was from the uh, original statute, it, biogas or biomethane is eligible uh, under the renewable fuel standard as an advanced, uh, advanced fuel, uh, advanced biofuel, uh, and yet to date there has not been any actual usage of that. So no company has stepped forward to take advantage of those, those renewable credits, the RINs, the Renewable Identification Number credits that are, are used. Oh, clean energy is? Oh, okay. Actually, I wasn't aware that they had. Okay. So the clean energy is, oh, oh forgive me. Is, is the renewable energy, and forgive me, I wasn't aware of it, is, is the clean energy program, so they're using, is it landfill reclaimed? Oh, that's terrific. I wasn't aware of that. Um, it's, uh, it's an important, uh, this must be quite recent since we completed our report. It's terrific to see there's movement in that area uh, because, uh, as, as you know, the cellulosic, ethanol, uh, and other advanced biofuels that we all thought would be commercial by 2012, back when we were writing in 2007, have not become commercial yet. and and biogas, biomethane is an option. So I'm, I'm very, uh, very interested to hear that, that companies are stepping forward. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> That's the, the range of the projects that have actually come online since 2005. Over 80 percent of all of our projects we showed are greenfield. That's part of the permitting challenge. They're not an extension. They're not, I'm building one more plant in a known field like with an oil well. So you're, for the first time going in, permitting something that's going to take a little bit longer than you otherwise would. We're also predominantly federal public lands. So you run into a situation, well, for, well, for example, you've got a geothermal site and you, you, first of all, you've got to get a lease. Right? right? Well, the lease needs an environmental document. They did a programmatic EIS that helped a lot on BLM lands, so that took two years. Well, I didn't count that into the delay. But then you, you obtain the lease, you have to go and do some exploration. You might have 5,000 acres of land, you've got to drill an exploration well. Well, right now, it's taking almost 12 months to get an exploration permit on your own federal geothermal lease. It's, it's just, it's, it's worse. 
It's worse. I mean, it, 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 it's... No, the natural gas stuff is not necessarily moving as fast, but BLM is putting a lot more resources into that. We, again, Ray Brady was talking yesterday about how they're now doing a lo what they call loaded EIS, where they're talking about they'll take the project from leasing through permitting in the same EIS. That document is taking seven years. Uh, we, 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 yesterday the Department of Energy met with people from industry and all the federal agencies and rapid response team because they were starting a project looking at, uh, starting with a road mapping project and then they're going to go from there with the goal they think, and this was their, their statement, they think they could cut the time in half just through smart processing and, you know, good management. I think that's true too. I think a lot of the delays have been for ironic reasons. For example, we had a project in Idaho that the, the applicant sat and sat and sat and he kept calling and he wondered what's going on. And the guy says, oh yeah, I'm looking at it. Well, they went up and actually checked and it was sitting on the desk of this BLM staff person. They asked him, this is BLM asking BLM what's going on. And he said, well, you know, we've never had one of these in Idaho. So it always goes to the bottom of the pile. Well, the Washington office delegated someone from Nevada for two months to Idaho to take care of the process, and it was issued. Um, there's a lot of that. When you're rebuilding an industry, which is what we're really doing, I mean, we had a very strong geothermal industry in the 70s, 80s, up until the early 90s, which is when PERPA fell apart. So for 15 years, we're looking at double-digit growth, cut prices in half, mm -hmm. and then zero for a long period of time. We're just rebuilding that industry not only is the industry having to rebuild that infrastructure, but the bureaucratic and administrative structure has to be rebuilt. And I mean, people, frankly, I was reminded this very vehemently by one of my younger staffers, that asking people to rely upon documents that were written before they were born is usually pushing the envelope. <laughs> so we have to sort of reinvent everything to go, to go with this. And, and that is part of the problem. The good news, though, is I think a lot of it could be cut in half. I think, I think it's feasible but it's gonna take some resources and a consistent effort. DOE just yesterday started this process. We had everybody from Fish and Wildlife Service to CEQ in the room. Uh, I think it could make a big difference. I know there's been improvements in other areas too because a lot of it is just problems that don't have anything to do with the project. They don't have anything to do with the fact that, gee, you've got a conflict with, a, in fact, you can deal with the conflicts and the environmental problems. What you can't deal with is the process and getting through the institutions of our bureaucracies. So the time frame is not about building a facility, it's more about permitting. No, you can build a facility in you know, six months to a year in most cases. And except, for example, if you're in Southern California, where they have nocturnal species that get disturbed by light, so you can only build during the daylight hours, uh, those plants take about twice as long as everyone else. Um, but, uh, or if you're in an area which gets extreme snowfall, like Oregon seems to get where its geothermal resources is. But no, in general, you can build projects in a much shorter period of time. Uh, there were some issues, especially in 2005, 6, and 7, of just getting the equipment. You literally could not get a power turbine, because that, that's when there was a big gas was booming. You, you know, they were, you want a turbine from Fuji, it's three years at least. Mm -hmm. That has subsided, the, infrastructure, the supply chain is much more available right now. But uh, our problem is now just bureaucratic. Yeah. Well, and I want to thank all of our panelists. Terrific job. Um, I always learn so much from everybody. And there are always all of these interesting pieces that it's so important for all of us to understand if we really want things to move forward, how these pieces really do have to be put together and how we overcome different impediments that may be uh, unintentional but, but exist because people are so used to doing things in terms of conventional forms of energy as opposed to not being experienced in terms of thinking about different renewable energy resources. And so I want to thank you all for being here and for your questions and for your attention and thank you all very, very much. So um, see you next time.